How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Electric scooters, the future of mobility or public menace? Today on Climate One, we talk about these new wheels in town. Joining us are Sanjay Dastur, co-founder of Boosted Boards and CEO of Skip Scooters, Megan Rose Dickey, senior reporter with TechCrunch, and Stuart Cohen, executive director of Transform. Quiet and zippy, electric motors are powering skateboards and stand-up scooters through the city streets. But are they causing more problems than they're solving? We'll find out right now on Climate One. Electric scooters and bicycles are suddenly sprouting on sidewalks and parking spaces all around the country. If you don't see them yet in your town, you might soon. In 2017, the number of shared bikes doubled to 100,000 nationwide, and investors are pouring money into more than 30 startup companies deploying bikes and scooters around commercial and residential neighborhoods. Uber and Lyft, seeing nimble competitors on their turf, are also getting into the bike and scooter space. Sum it all up, and mobility as a service is becoming more flexible and accessible. What does that mean for urban life and greenhouse gas emissions? Will it put a dent in the reign of the almighty automobile? Sanjay, let's begin with you. Uh, seven years ago, you got into, uh, started Boosted Boards. What was your inspiration and your goal starting a skateboard scump- company? Yeah, it was an odd choice because I'd never skateboarded before. Um, <laughs> but we were, uh, a group of us were in graduate school at Stanford. Stanford has a very spread out campus, and Palo Alto as a city is a little bit far from campus for walking. And so the boosted board was kind of a, a fun thing we built for ourselves to be able to get around the campus and cover these short trips in between buildings or parking lots or being able to take it onto the Caltrain system, the, the, the transit system in the Bay Area, um, and be able to cover these short distances. And what we found was that people, liked it because it was interesting and cool, but then after they started to use it, they said, wow, this actually changed the way that I get around my city. So it started, you know, the classic story of a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, you know, uh, solving a problem in their life and starting a company to, to, uh, to address that. Uh, Megan Rose Dickey, where is this happening? To give us a sense of the geographic scope of these scooters and bikes that are popping up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's worldwide, especially with, with bike share. We see bike share in um, in China. Like, it, that's where it really kind of took off. And then with with these electric scooters, we're seeing them all across the nation in San Francisco, in Austin, Texas, in Santa Monica, California, Venice, California, Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, I think there are some in North Carolina. They're, they're kind of just popping up all over the the state. And, and even Lime, for example, they have some scooters over in Switzerland. And the rollout, how these things have appeared has had a big impact on how they've been received by, by citizens. So uh, Megan, tell us how they rolled out in San Francisco and how that compares to the rollout in other cities, because there's been quite a difference in the way they <laughs> yeah. kind of shown up. Yeah, it was, um, I'm, I'm not supposed to swear, probably not. So uh, <laughs> it, uh, it wasn't great the way that they rolled out in San Francisco. And a lot of city regulators were pretty upset with uh, with Bird, Lime, and Spin, and so this was back in in April, I believe. They first kind of Suddenly deployed were everywhere. Yeah, they yeah. just deployed on the streets of San Francisco. Next thing you know, people are on like green scooters, black scooters, <laughs> orange scooters, just all on the sidewalks, and um, and this prompted it prompted a few things from the city of San Francisco. Uh, one was a cease and desist letter from the city attorney um, that held zero weight whatsoever, and they just kind of stayed on the streets. But um, it it later resulted in a permitting process. So similar to what San Francisco did around uh, bike share, the um, one of San Francisco's legislative bodies then. Uh, worked with some city legislators to develop a permitting process to ensure that that scooters weren't totally going to ruin the city and make things super complicated. Sanjay, you came out uh, in a rolled out in a different way in in Washington D.C. A little smoother. Tell us about how that rollout happened. 
Yeah, so we're actually based in San Francisco. So our uh -huh. first choice to launch was was here. Um, but we knew that uh, based on how bike share had rolled out in San Francisco, there would be a permitting process. So we chose to work with uh, a city on creating a permit and launching with their permission first. And Washington, D.C. already had a par permitting process for dockless bike share. Um, so they had already created this process, and we were able to work with the DOT, the Department of Transportation, locally in Washington, D.C. to create kind of a sub-permit for dockless scooters and be the first to launch there in fact. February. So did you just say functioning government in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was lo city, local government. City local government. government. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Stuart Cohen, uh, where does this add up? Is this going to, uh, this, you know, last mile, first mile has been a, a vexing problem in transportation for a long time, getting to and from a train or a bus. Um, is this a game changer? Uh, I think we still have to wait to see whether it's a game changer. I think what is a game changer is just the profusion of choices that uh, we increasingly have. And so uh, add this on to bike share, add this on to the uh, you know, Uber, Lyft, including their shared services, uh, chariot, there's all of these other you know, shuttles that are starting. Having all of those, and es essentially, essentially, once they become either all in one app or just very easy to organize, uh, brings to what you said, mobility as a service, when people don't have to think about where's my car keys, they just have to think about what are my best options for getting there, the, you know, mm -hmm. choosing between affordability, you know, how quick it is, how comfortable, or with scooters or bike shares, how fun it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think two of the, the biggest issues around this, this influx of electric scooters in cities is, um, one, them being on sidewalks. So, um, I, like, not only is it... Um, is it frustrating for pedestrians who are able-bodied? But think about people who um, are in wheelchairs, and then next thing you know, there's a scooter in yeah. the middle of a sidewalk. Like it doesn't. It's easier to navigate that if you're able-bodied, but not so much if you're if you're in a wheelchair. Well, I, I think a lot of it comes down to user behavior, and not just the vehicle itself. I mean, we mm -hmm. have reckless drivers, and we have safe drivers. Uh, we have people who double park their cars you know, park them on sidewalks, block pedestrian access with their cars just as much as we do with these vehicles. Um, and so I think a lot of it- And we don't blame the cars, we blame the driver. <clears throat> exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. And so I, I think, uh, you know, having access to these vehicles can bring out both the best and the worst in someone when they think about how they're impacting the people around them. I think a lot of the conversation has been about the riders and about the, the, the businesses. I think there's another conversation to be had around the people who don't ride. So if you think about the, the folks who are, you know, these scooters or bikes or other vehicles in their way. How, how does this work with them? Um, but I think a lot of that comes down to education, uh, proper etiquette, advocacy, and actually building systems that work well. So for example, in Washington, D.C., the reason we didn't make the news there is because <laughs> there hasn't been this kind of backlash, right? We actually worked with the city. We worked with the National Park Service. We worked with the different police departments. Um, we worked with citizen groups in D.C. And so we created a, a, a very formal and structured rollout process where there was a way for people to make sure that we were doing our job. And as a result, we haven't been in the news there because it actually is working great. But a lot of tech companies want to get in the news. It's free buzz, free publicity. You're saying it's kind of good not to be in the news? Uh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, but, but I would say that uh, <clears throat> some of the news about this is less about the vehicle and less about the model, and it's more about the way it's introduced and launched and run. Let's talk about data, because there's the there's, data is, is key to to all of this. Uh, Megan Rose Dickey, you know, uh, when Uber and Lyft came on the scene, regulators were playing catch up, and they didn't mm -hmm. put they didn't really get the data out of those companies. Now with scooters, you know, what what are we learning from bike share scooters? It's probably really early, but tell us what the data is uh, telling us in terms of you know the social patterns, the commute patterns people are using these new tools. Yeah, so I mean, what what cities like like San Francisco are um, looking for? from these scooter companies is information around trip data because essentially this the pilot program that the city of San Francisco is doing is a, is its purpose is to see if electric scooters can actually work in the city and actually like maybe reduce traffic or like you know like by by getting more people on scooters and fewer people in cars so that's why they need that trip data to to really see how it kind of compares to a world without the electric scooters versus a world with them. And Stuart Cohen, that didn't happen so much with, with Uber and Lyft because the, the regulators didn't make handing over the data a condition of getting a permit. And that, that kind of genie was out of the bottle. Is that being addressed this time where it's like, oh, you, you know, you want a permit, give us your data, you'll get your permit. Uh, it is. It's been interesting to watch the evolution. Uh, you know, regulators were 
caught off guard early on by these new business models. Um, but the uh, permit application for the scooters is really fascinating uh, because uh, San Francisco has had time uh, to kind of create a whole new mobility uh, uh, framework that, that they're looking for with 10 goals. And so they are, they're requiring everything from uh, data sharing to, uh, you know, you have to do outreach in multiple languages to low income discounts. Uh, there's about 40 uh, uh, very prescriptive items to be able to apply for this permit. And at the end of the day, you might get 250 scooters at first or 500. So um, uh, the fact that 12 of these applications went in um, so quickly, uh, uh, even though it was so prescriptive, really just shows two things. It, it shows how much interest uh, and how much potential these scooters have, uh, certainly in the eyes of kind of venture capitalists. Uh, and it shows how regulators are quickly coming up to speed on, oh, yeah, we kind of control the streets. We, uh, we, we can ask for uh, things that meet our equity and, and, and climate and other goals. Let's talk about that investor fervor. Uh, Megan Rose Dickey, you know, Bird is valued at about a billion dollars. Uh, two billion now, two billion. actually. Uh, okay. Yeah, that yeah. was last week. <laughs> <It's, yeah, laughs> that was, that was <laughs> since we started. Gotta keep up. <laughs> a double Bird. Okay, two billion for a company. Like, really? Stupid. I mean, explain how... <laughs> I can't but, explain it. I wish I could. <laughs> I really wish I could explain it. Um, but the thing is that VCs see this as the next hot market. So they're just pouring money into... So Bird, I guess, is... Yeah, Bird is definitely up there, and then Lime has uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding. Uh, it's just it's just kind of nuts because they think it's the next big thing, and maybe it will be, maybe it won't. Sanjay uh, you know, how much money can be made renting out scooters a dollar at a time? Um, well, I would say it's more about how we how we use transportation. So if you think about the longest trips that we take, you know, 5,000 mile or 3,000 mile trips, we don't take those that frequently. If you think about 10 or 20 or 30 mile trips, normally with cars, we take those somewhat frequently. But we take a lot of short trips. And actually most of the trips that we take are short. And so if you were to think about the transportation market by distance and say, how many short trips are there to be provided uh, versus how many medium length trips and how many long trips, most of it is the short trip. Sanjay, talk about the job creation. One of the uh, you know criticisms of Uber and Lyft is that those are not really real jobs. They're, they're, they're sidelines for people. Um, some similar things happening in scooters where people can collect scooters and charge them overnight, get paid. So, so address the employment and job side of the scooter. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I think it's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, the fact that I could choose to start a new job, you know, in the gig economy and a week later or even less be earning money is really powerful, right? When people have a change in their financial circumstances or when they just choose to, to make a change in their life, um, the ability to kind of onboard that very quickly versus going through a vocational program or a long training program or a university degree means that you can really start earning money quickly, whether that's through startups like Airbnb and renting out your home or, you know, Instacart and DoorDash and Postmates and Uber and Lyft, you know, you can earn money in a lot of different ways. So I think um, this is another way for people to do that. And and it's, it's great because it matches that need and that desire from folks with the fact that these scooters do need to get charged and moved and everything. I think in the long run, it's important, like with all of these companies, to have some kind of sustainable um, and predictable way for people to engage on the labor side. I mean, whether that's with training, whether that's with you know benefits, whether they should be contractors or W-2 employees, I mean, that, that's an important conversation that, that we're seeing. And I think especially for transportation systems, um, if you look at mass transit, if you look at uh, ride share now especially, um, there's a sense like these are here to stay. And so we should be investing not just for the next 30 days or 60 days of the startup's life, but actually over many years to make sure this is an important part of the fabric of the, of the community. Um, so we're making a lot of investments in San Francisco towards training for things like maintaining the scooters, repairing them. Um, we've made some big commitments to some groups um, as part of our permit process to say, look, we'd actually like to do this the right way and not just uh, bring up a bunch of gig economy workers um, and then have no nothing for them on the back end. There's been some uh, sabotage concerns. There's been, you know, some of them, people, for whatever reasons, I've, I've seen uh, bike shares that are in kind of, you know, homeless camps. There's other, been reports of snipped cables. You know, how big a problem is, is sabotage? People angry at these scooters trying to, uh, to uh, yeah, sabotage them in some way. Yeah, I think in San Francisco, it's been uh, part of, of a broader backlash uh, about technology companies and their role in the community, mm -hmm. um, about, um, you know, 
using public space and public resources for private gain, right? These are interesting conversations to have. And I think some of the stories about things like scooter brake lines or bike brake lines getting snipped is, is actually part of that. In Washington, D.C., we actually haven't seen much of that. Mm. Um, we have seen some vandalism of the vehicles, just like you'd see with anything. But generally, people have been very positive about not just our product, but competitors' products that are all operating. So Jump is in Washington, D.C., um, uh, Mobike, Ofo, Spin, and Lime have all done bike share. Us, Bird, and Lime have been doing scooters. And so there's a, a, a multitude of choices, and Washington, D.C. hasn't seen that same kind of backlash. Yeah, and something I'll, I'll just add to that, um, because I, I spoke with Lime um, in in either May or June, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, uh, they said that like worldwide of all their products that like theft and vandalism only affects like less than 1% of its entire fleet. And I, I reached out to them because I saw, well, I saw a Lime bike where it wasn't supposed to be. And then I had also seen some like snipped Lime scooters and they said that it's, it's not actually as big of a problem as it may seem. Granted, they have like a very large fleet, but it, at least for them, it sounds like it's not a huge problem and doesn't happen too often. Yeah, makes me think when I, I rode 100 miles on a bike share in San Francisco last year, and it makes me think now when I test those brakes before I hop yeah. on the bike, right? <laughs> yeah. If you're just joining us, we're talking about new scooters and uh, bike shares in American cities with Megan Rose Dickey, senior reporter at TechCrunch, Stuart Cohen from Transform, and Sanjay Dastur, co-founder of Boosted Boards and CEO of uh, Skip Scooters. Um, Sanjay, why is this happening now? I mean, there was the Segway 15 years ago, Razor, you know, how many kids have had Razors? Scooters have been around forever. Why this sudden proliferation now? What's enabling this? Yeah, it's a few things. So I I think there's broadly this push towards the bike lane being uh, a way to solve a lot of the transportation needs, especially of a dense city or a campus or or a dense neighborhood. And I think a lot of that comes from whether the car lane is uh, serving us better over time or worse. And I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the car lane is less and less of the best solution for certain types of trips, especially in cities. And as cities get more dense and as you know, e-commerce delivery trucks are blocking lanes or as Lyft and Uber cars are pulling over, there's a sense of, well, is the car lane really the fastest and most effective way to get around? And so the bike lane has seen a, a growth in popularity. So if you look at the e- even long-standing programs like City Bike uh, in New York, uh, you've seen ridership grow um, uh, and, and the popularity of the program increase. And then Separately, there's a technology component to this. Now everyone has a smartphone. They can hail a car just you know, by pushing a few buttons on that phone. They can, uh, you can embed those same phone components into a vehicle for very, very low cost. So now these vehicles can have GPS. They can have sensors that detect if they've fallen over or not. They have full-time you know, SIM card, cellular connections to the internet. That's all been brought about by smartphones. And so if you look at the cost of building something comparable to the Segway from 15 years ago in performance, it's much less expensive today. And then it's also being used in a way where people feel, oh, this is this is actually a better solution for me than the car that I used to use. And the GPS seems key because you can see exactly where that scooter is on, wh- on which sidewalk. So I don't have to wa- go wandering around looking for where that scooter is. Exactly. Okay. S- Stuart Cohen, um, you know, how big of a tr- you know, transformation is this going to be uh, in, in, in transportation? I'd like to also connect it to autonomous vehicles. Mm-hmm. You know, that same technological change that Sanjay just described is coming toward vehicles, and there's a lot of hype and excitement about autonomous, connected, electric, and shared vehicles. Are, we gonna, are the scooters a precursor for what we're going to see in cars? Uh, I don't know if they're a precursor. Uh, you know, I think the closest precursor is kind of the the uh, Lyft Uber uh, model uh, because uh, increasingly it seems like the first autonomous vehicles that we'll all get to experience will be fleet vehicles. Uh, and they'll be Wa- too expensive to buy. They'll be too expensive <clears throat> to buy. Uh, Waymo, which is the Google Alphabet company. Um, had been kind of leaning towards, you know, supporting production and recently announced that they're going to be buying their own fleet for fleet vehicles. Uh, and that, of course, is where Uber and Lyft are going. So um, it's going to be profound. I think a, a lot of us in the planning profession, a lot of regulators are really unprepared. There's now suddenly over the last few years this profusion of conferences and papers about <laughs> will it be Armageddon, you know, no, no, awful, or will it be paradise? Um, but I think if we don't act, uh, it, it is going to be awful. And so what it could look like is a lot more driving on our streets uh, because... 
uh, it's going to become so much easier, more competitive. Uh, you know, uh, the price of being in an autonomous fleet vehicle will be much lower than the current kind of Uber Lyft model, uh, and uh, it will become very attractive. And so we're going to even more so need to really prioritize those trips that are made in a shared way. Uh, but we can have, you know, we've been trying to get rid of single occupant vehicle trips, and now there's this whole specter of zero occupant vehicle trips uh, becoming <laughs> a large part of our transportation system. Zombie cars. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Megan Rose Dickey, there's a lot more money on the it's going to be paradise side of that equation than there is it's going to be Armageddon side. There's a lot of, of companies that have a financial stake in selling us that rosy picture of autonomous mm -hmm. vehicles because they get to sell lots of fancy stuff to, right? Versus, uh, oh, it's going to be zombie car <laughs> gridlock, right? There's not a lot of money pushing that. So you know, comment on that because you cover the hype machine in Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny, I was actually in, um, I was in a self-driving car yesterday. Well, I'll say like, I'll put self-driving in quotes. Um, it was, it was more so similar to Tesla's autopilot mode where, you know, it can handle like lane changes and uh, following distance, but it's not meant to, it's not meant for like city, like street driving. But um, I think the, the opportunity with autonomous vehicles is that while, like, while if you think of Uber and Lyft right now, they're, the cars are driven by, like, regular good old-fashioned humans, and they are incentivized to be out on the road to always be looking for those fares. So I think in an ideal sort of world, and maybe, like, what these companies are envisioning is that if there are also autonomous vehicles, then they'll know, like, they'll just drive themselves back to the, the factory or the depot or wherever. And they're, not, they're not just going to be, like, driving around, like, waiting to get that ding. Like, they'll actually, hopefully, stop driving, get off the street, and then if they get pinged, then go back out. We're talking about new mobility at Climate One. Time for our lightning round. Going to ask uh, our, three of our guests, I'll mention a noun, uh, and you're going to say the first thing that comes to mind, or unfiltered, reckless abandon, <laughs> whatever that comes to your mind first, and then we'll also have a true and false portion. So first, uh, Sanjay Destour, what comes to mind when I say scooter bros? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, unfortunate. Uh, Megan Rose Dickey, zombie cars. Uh, dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart Cohen, Koch brothers. Ooh, transit killers. New York Times story recently about them opposing uh, uh, funding for transit systems around the country. Uh, true or false, uh, Megan Rose Dickey, most scooter startups will fail. <laughs> I'm going to go with true. true. Uh, Sanjay Dastur, Sorry. most <laughs> new startups will also fail. Most new startups? News, new, oh. like news business. Oh, uh, well, most startups fail, so true. Uh, Stuart <laughs> Cohen, uh, mass, true or false, mass transit is a great marketing name to get people onto trains and buses. Very false. <laughs> Sanjay Dastur, true or false, one day a big automaker will buy an electric scooter company. True. Uh, Stuart Cohen, true or false, San Francisco should permit high-rise housing along Golden Gate Park to increase density, property values, and tax revenues. Medium density, so I would say false. <laughs> uh, make it like uh, Central Park. Last yeah. one, uh, true or false, Megan Rose Dickey, you recently visited a tooth straightening startup and found <laughs> out you needed a root canal. Yes, but what does that have to do with it? <laughs> I don't know. I just saw it on your Twitter feed, so I think it would yeah, close with it. Yeah, the done. I have my crown. It's been, it was a whole thing, but yeah. Things you, <laughs> things you do for your job. You put it on your Twitter feed. Let's give them a round for uh, getting through that. I want to wrap up with talking about about China. Stuart Cohen, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, electrification. People talk about China. A lot of the bike sharing, DD, a lot of this emerged in China. A lot of people probably seen those photos of all those huge graveyard of abandoned bicycles. So tell yeah. us how how you know the future of mobility may be happening in China. Uh, well, well, I think the future of a lot of things are happening in China, <laughs> but um, uh, but we're starting to see the shift. I mean, China's uh, trajectory on owning personal ownership of vehicles is, you know, it's just skyrocketed. Um, and uh, uh, luckily, I think that the sharing economy there, uh, backed by venture capital, um, 
has the potential to start to turn that. And so, um, you know, there's a lot to be seen, but, but it happens there on a mass scale that is enabling a lot of these technologies to be rolled out here. Uh, I, I haven't studied China extensively, haven't been there. So, you know, it, it is uh, just really important to, to watch it on, on these because the technologies, like, like we said, on, both on bike share and, and scooter kind of happen there first. Sanjay Destour, can a trade war with China affect any of this? The supply chain, the you know, supply, these scooters made in China, if we go to a trade war with China, how's this going to be a bump in the road? I, I think that could change the economics of the business slightly um, in terms of what the vehicles cost and what it costs to get them here, if there's delays in being able to produce vehicles and put them on the road. But I think in the grand scheme of things, it won't be an issue. I think the interesting thing about, about China as, as an example for us to leave with is that Didi, which is one of the largest uh, rideshare companies in China, saw a significant reduction in the demand for their vehicles and their services below three miles once bike share became mature in certain markets. And I think like if you were to look at San Francisco or any other city and say, would you rather that those less than three mile trips were happening by car or by something like a bicycle or a scooter, I think most of us would choose the latter. I lived in Beijing in the 80s uh, before people had family cars. It was a lot easier to get around then. Rode my bike all over Beijing. I'd take, it, I'd take Beijing in the 80s for Beijing uh, in terms of mobility. Now, uh, we didn't see a lot of this coming. I want to close with Megan Rose Dickey. I don't think people two years ago would see that, well, this you know, explosion of scooters and mobility on American streets. What else out there is that we may not be seeing? What innovation do you think that's out there that might get bigger that isn't on a horizon yet? Um, flying taxis. I mean, which is already kind of on the horizon. Uber is doing a really big, <clears throat> really big push in, in that area. They're saying by 2020, they're going to be doing demo flights and 2022, they'll be commercially available. So that's next. <laughs> Probably ne one of your next assignments going exactly. on. Exactly. Okay. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows recorded with a live audience are available wherever you podcast. You can join us on Twitter using our handle at ClimateONE. I'm Greg Dalton. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time.